All right. I think we're getting started. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Kishwa Rizvi. I'm a professor in the History of Art Department here at Yale University. Welcome to the Iran Colloquium, which is a part of our Iranian Studies program here at Yale. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues, um, and especially Farbod Honar Pichet, Pichet, um, who has been um, organizing this series, and also our colleagues in the Council for Middle East Studies who make it all possible. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, our speaker is our own um, Professor Sam Hodgkin, uh, who will be um, speaking for about 45 minutes or so on a current project. Uh, he is an assistant professor of comparative literature at Yale, and he is a literary scholar and cultural historian of medieval and modern Eurasia. He received his PhD in 2018 from the University of Chicago and joined Yale um, immediately after the next year, 2019. We're very happy to have him here. And I speak um, both for myself and my colleagues and our students to say how lucky we are um, to have a colleague who is comfortable working across media, across disciplines, um, and generously invites all of us into his work. Um, so thank you, Sam, for sharing um, your time with all of us, and especially today. Um, he's interested in classical Persianate poetry and its afterlife in modernist literature and literary institutions across Central and South Asia, the Caucasus and the Middle East. And his research languages are too many for me to tabulate here, um, but certainly the focus is on Persian and Russian as well as Turkic languages. Um, and he has great facility in all of them. Today's talk uh, presents one chapter of his first book project entitled The Nightingale's Congress, literary representatives in the communist East. The book as a whole argues that the Soviet internationalist project of world literature emerged from sustained engagement between leftist writers of West and South Asia and state-sponsored writers of the multinational Soviet East who drew on their shared Persianate literary training to articulate the post-colonial poetics of political representation. I'm really excited to hear more about it in the talk today, which is titled The City and the Country on the Tempo. Oh, that's not it. Um, that's not your talk. <laughs> Sorry, Sam, I'm going to let you take it from here because I'm otherwise talking myself into a hole. Welcome. Thank you so much, Kishwar. And uh, thanks um, again to Farbud and to um, Marwa. Uh, Kabur and Kristen Siebert, um, who also worked very hard to make these, these colloquia happen. Um, I'm going to uh, share with you the presentation, which will remind me as well of the title. Um, so, so today the talk is um, Persian uh, Under the Red Dome, Persian Poetic Play, Imperial Regimes of Difference. Um, and I'll just start by saying, that uh, certain elements of 20th century Soviet state culture are best understood as part of what we could call a Eurasian imperial longue durée. And I say this at some remove from the tradition in Western Sovietology and leftist anti-Stalinism of seeing the Soviet project as an atavistic revival of the eternal Russian state or an even longer uh, Soviet, uh, an even longer Asiatic despotism. I have in mind rather the gestures by which the apparatus of imperial rule can contain difference, even celebrate it as the foundation of sovereignty, by contrast with the nation's need for the fiction of homogeneity. There's nothing new in the idea that Soviet nationality's policy preserved or revived aspects of imperial systems of multinational and multi-confessional governance. But the historians who make this more rigorous comparison generally look no further back than the Romanov and Habsburg models of European land empire. Whereas I'd say the place to start is another imperial tradition developed in the Persian states of Eurasia. Uh, without claiming any sort of uh, civilizational unity here, uh, we can say that there are some durable elements in the repertoire um, 
uh, for the performance of contained cultural diversity that make a striking reappearance in Soviet uh, public culture, especially in public representations of the relationship between Moscow and the Soviet East. Uh, whether they are proudly and artlessly appropriated or parodied in acts of anti-imperial critique or something ambivalent between these two scenarios. And to explain how those Persianate elements became so important to Soviet multinational culture, we have to set aside the structural metaphor of cultural hybridity with its assumption that culture works genealogically and instead attend to the life of cultural forms themselves and to the sudden leaps, reappearances and reappropriations that they so often accomplish. And to give you a sense of what I mean, I'll start off with two speeches, both given in 1935 by a Soviet poet, an Iranian emigre living in Moscow, Abul Qasem Lahuti. And Lahuti is a fascinating cultural intermediary and I'd be happy to talk more about him afterwards. But for now, su suffice it to say that in 1935, he was the top Easterner uh, in the Secretariat of the Soviet Writers' Union, the flagship institution of multinational Soviet culture. And he gave these two speeches at major occasions for the promulgation of Soviet international and multinational friendship, respectively. He gave the first at June at the in June at the Congress for the Defense of Culture in Paris, and the second in December at a meeting at the Kremlin between Stalin and Tajik and Turkmen collective farmers. The first occasion tried to spark a broadened Soviet-centered internationalism of the Popular Front, and at the second, the friendship of peoples was unveiled as a Soviet multinational slogan. Now, the central theme of the Paris Congress was the fascist threat to world culture. And Lahuti's speech came during the day devoted to the nation and culture. Lahuti, who for the previous decade had been particularly involved in the literary culture of the Tajik SSR, ceremonially gifted Tajik made quilted robes to the French writers André Gide and Henri Barbus and made them honorary citizens of the Tajik SSR. He spoke about Soviet efforts to preserve the diversity of national cultures, especially in the Eastern republics, while promoting mutual understanding. This he contrasted with the Russian imperial schema for ethnic diversity, which were gu guided, so he says, by the principle of divide and conquer. Um, curiously, he illustrates this point with an example uh, from the sumptuary laws of the Emirate of Bukhara that preceded its Russian protectorate status, the cloth belt that Jews were required to wear in public, referred to as the Nahe Latinat, the cursed cord, which you can see here in a photo from the Turkestan album. Okay, so although the example suits the Congress's concern for the fate of German Jewry, and it's true to the general legal status of uh, Jews under Tsarist rule, his argument that the Nahe Latinat was part of the Tsarist introduction of sectarian or nationalist poison to previously tolerant populations is a total inversion of what his example actually implies, that the Tsarist confessional system owed something to the Islamicate confessional systems that the Russian Empire inherited as it expanded, which is in fact true. At the end of his speech, he declares that the party has managed to permanently sever the Nahe Latinat, the rope of malediction, and has given into the hands of the people in its stead, the Nahe Vahdat, the bond of unity and culture. So from differentiation of dress to unity of purpose. And incidentally, Lahuti's image comes implicitly from the Quran's comparison of the unity of, Muslim, of the Muslim community to the rope by which a caravan stays together. Al-Urwat al the uh, firmest bond, a phrase that had been a rallying cry for Islamic reformists for a half century by the time of Lahuti's speech. Now, setting imperial culture alongside Soviet multinational culture for the purpose of contrast may seem to us a dangerous rhetorical gambit, given all the surplus meaning that such a comparison produces. But as we will see, it was a go-to move for Soviet Eastern writers in the 30s. Lahuti extended the comparison uh, to, uh, 
much further in his speech at the Politburo's reception in December for representatives of Turkmen and Tajik model collective farms, which he delivered in Russian, Persian, and uh, Turkic. Observing state receptions for successful work brigades, he said, he had been reminded of how great rulers such as Chinggis Khan and Alexander of Macedon received backwards peoples. Such rulers, he explains, held audiences on the one condition that these backwards peoples must be definitively defeated. But the condition for a reception with our leader is that the backwards peoples, the working people, must without fail be victorious. Not only does his contrast rely on the implicit likeness between the Soviet gift economy of overfulfilled production, uh, production quotas and the economy of imperial tribute, he also sets Stalin's paternal reception of a Tajik girl pioneer alongside the practice of human tribute and especially, especially nauseatingly alongside concubinage, whereas previous conquerors made the defeated and their wives and daughters their property, Stalin, quote, kissed this little daughter on the eyes. He gave her a watch. At the base of this out of control analogy is um, an image from Lahuti's childhood in uh, Kerman Shah in Iran, an Achaemenid frieze on a mountain outside of his hometown, which he visited as a child. Like many ancient Near Eastern tribute scenes, the frieze models the relationship between the king of kings and subject peoples by placing before him subjects differentiated by hairstyle and costume. Lahuti thus imagines a new Soviet frieze, artistically better to carve on the mountains of the Caucasus and Central Asia, and then on the whole world, in which the peoples appear before Stalin as not captives, but victors who kiss and hug their leader. And in fact, here again, we see the Tajik collective farmers at that ceremony dressing Stalin and other leading Politburo members in Tajik robes with laughter and joking all around. Following this first Kremlin ceremony, the giving and wearing of national robes became a modular feature of public celebrations of Eastern cultures. And uh, here we have images from late 30s receptions for Buryat Mongol and Uzbek representatives. And these seem to me very rich images of deceptively complex ceremonial worth reading closely. They highlight the various long imperial histories of robe investiture, which come to Buryatia, for example, from the Mongol adoption of Arabo-Persian investiture ceremonies, but also from their distinct but connected history in diplomatic relations between China and the nomads. The 1935 ceremony featured other gifts. The Turkmen farmers gave Stalin a hand-knotted carpet with Lenin's face on it, and Lahuti presented an epic poem about competition between collective farms, which compared such efforts to the exploits of the Shahnameh, the canonical classical Persian epic. In the course of his speech, Lahuti presented Stalin with another shorter poem composed extemporaneously during the ceremony. And here's the text of the poem in the original Persian and in the Russian translation that Lahuti's wife, a Jewish orientalist, hurriedly dictated over the phone during the ceremony. While Stalin in Tajik garb looked upon the harvest of his labor, in Turkmen craftsmanship, Lenin's image emerged to give praise. In these ceremonies, speeches, and poems, where competing historical analogies and ethnically defined repertories jostle against each other, what may at first present itself to us as clumsiness or confusion might be better understood as a sort of playfulness. National costumes and types are placed in quotes as if in a kind of ethnic drag their performativity recognized at the same moment and in the same gesture that puts them to deadly serious politically con consequential use. So many features of this performance may also be found 
in the Persianate imperial cultures of Eurasia. The gift economy between the imperial center and a diverse procession of peoples differentiated by costume, sometimes mandatorily, bound by a poetics of praise and unequal romantic friendship that is linked by amphiboly to both familial and erotic love. Within this economy of mutual obligation, as Bruce Grant has noted, the imperial rulers may present their rule itself as a gift. Lahuti, whom resentful fellow writers in the Soviet Union referred to as a court poet, drew on the Persianate panegyric repertory beginning in the early 30s and thus contributed to an articulation of Stalinism's authoritarian poetics of multinational political representation in which, on Grant's terms, the act of taking is enabled by the language of giving. But here I wish to add that, at least in Eurasian empires, well before European colonialism, imperial sovereignty was the aggregate of a variety of personalized, non-modularized exchanges between the ruler and the representatives of ruled groups. In each case, the ruler gives a costume that signifies legitimate representation of an ethnicity or class, and the wearer, by virtue of that representative authority, transfers sovereignty in return to the ruler. This gestural repertory is absolutely crucial to a formal or structural perspective on empires as a historical phenomenon. Jane Burbank and Frederick Cooper have usefully defined empires as polities that maintain distinction and hierarchy as they incorporate new people. And much of the diversity among imperial models is in the relative importance of these two aspects of the management of difference. Distinction, that is the recognition and even reification of distinct categories, and hierarchy. Within this framework, the case of, say, the early Spanish Americas presents us with extreme hierarchy, as in chattel slavery or the theory that indigenous Americans lacked souls, and limited capacity for containing distinction, as in the expulsion of Jews and Muslims. Russian scholars who have argued that the Russian Empire was fundamentally unlike West European overseas colonial empires have done so based on a claim, in my opinion exaggerated, that it was a system of distinction without hierarchy. That is, in comparison to non-Russians in the Russian Empire and Soviet Union, Russians, say Russian peasants, received different but not preferential treatment. Whatever the features of a particular imperial arrangement, both distinction and hierarchy are articulated through a poetics of political representation and preserved through a repertory of iterative state ceremonies that draw on that poetics. My purpose in this presentation is not to relitigate old and vexed questions about whether land empires are categorically different from overseas empires or what it means to call the Soviet Union an empire. Rather, by focusing on the poetics and the ceremonial of Stalinist multinational and international regime, regimes of difference, and in particular the features of that poetics and ceremonial that are borrowed from non-European political cultures, I'm going to suggest a new way of thinking about the Eurasian imperial long durée. Recurrence of features from one empire to another is usually explained in terms of structural continuities of culture and political organization. And such continuities are certainly real and very important, but leaning on them as an explanatory mechanism can produce reductive historiography in which centuries of experimentation, dynamism, and contingency blur into an essentialized civilizational unity. In that category, I'd include the long and ideological suspect tradition I already mentioned of treating Russian and Soviet autocracy as a legacy of Mongol rule, an, an ineradicable taint of the Asiatic at the root of Russian political culture. One particular problem for any account of Stalinism as an Asiatic restoration is that for many of the features that Soviet multinational discourse and ceremonial shares with pre-modern Eurasian empires, no counterpart exists in the Romanov state. More helpful, I think, is the approach to cultural non-synchrony developed within the Russian tradition of historical poetics. As the late 19th century Russian literary theorist Alexander Vysilovsky suggested, 
possibilities contained within the cultural forms of bygone societies can suddenly spring into use if an exemplar of such a form happens to be rediscovered in a propitious moment. The theoretical tradition emerging from Vysilovsky's work in the 20th century has tended to conceive of this lingering presence of possibilities for expression from other times in terms of continuity or persistence through a single canonical tradition, as in, for example, the way Mikhail Bakhtin talks about genre memory. This makes sense. Uh, but uh, this makes sense because Vysilovsky himself developed his conception of non-synchrony in conversation with the anthropologist Edward Burnett Tyler's concept of cultural survivals. But in the Soviet case, and more broadly in the case of European empires, um, we find a reminder that the serendipitous discovery and deployment of a form that is not part of the historically and culturally defined repertoire uh, of a society need not take place within a tradition, whether it's an art form or a political formation. In the Soviet case, sorry, in the Soviet case, it was precisely the temporary dehierarchization of cultural difference that allowed for the deployment of a wide variety of possible forms and poetics, uh, sorry, possible forms in politics and poetics. In fact, that distinction may be unhelpful here. In logocentric and literature obsessed Stalinist public culture, literary forms carried with them formal possibilities for poetics. This was not a persistence of forgotten forms, but the amalgamation of several distinct formal repertories into one large and unstable repertory. Um, and I, I just wanna reassure people in the chat that uh, there isn't a PowerPoint showing right now because this is a space between PowerPoint slides where I, I just uh, want to keep your focus on uh, the argument I'm making and then I'll, I'll show you some more examples. Here I will make two general observations about the dynamics that obtained in this moment of fusion, which may tell us something about other such moments. First, although this situation resulted from a leveling of cultural hierarchies, that is from the anti-colonialism and critiques of Russian chauvinism of the 20s and early 30s, in the ensuing clamor of different cultural forms um, throughout the Soviet Union that expressed similar meanings or performed similar functions, the forms that propagated more widely tended to be the ones that hierarchized the schema of difference to a greater degree, leading ultimately to an increased hierarchization of difference, both in the domain of representation and in the political domain. But second, I want to emphasize that, as we've already seen, that hierarchization and the violence that underwrote it did not inhibit, but in some ways actually created a dynamic of play, of tacit and sometimes explicit recognition by participants in rituals of representation and sovereignty, that the categories of difference that they were constituting were contingent and perhaps even arbitrary both in the establishment of the Stalinist hierarchy of national difference and in the forms of Stalinist difference play, the Persian cultural and political repertory played an outsized role. I'll pull back for a moment to give you a sense of where this talk fits within my research more broadly. The material I'm presenting today is from a chapter in the middle of my book in progress. The book as a whole is concerned with the poetics of political representation and how Persian it forms as they were redeployed in the system of Soviet multinational literature mediated the transition from, a, uh, from the romantic nationalist institution of the national poet to the post-colonial institution that I call the literary representative. Um, I'm just gonna stop the share because it seems to be distracting people. There we are. Um, so, um, so I'm discussing um, the post-colonial institution that I call the literary representative, a fusion of poet and functionary that Lahuti and his contemporaries in the Soviet East pioneered. The book as a whole is mostly agent-oriented in the sense that it's concerned with spokespersonship, 
and the fusion of author function and bureaucratic functionary in literary institutions. But what I'm presenting today is one of the sections of the project uh, where I focus on the vitality of the literary and other cultural forms themselves, the ways that they broker the transactions of political representation. So to illustrate the possibilities contained within the Persianate repertory of cultural forms and activated by the Stalinist multinational system, it may be helpful to see those possibilities as opportunities not taken in a different imperial context. So before returning to the Soviet 30s, let's take a brief and admittedly a little superficial detour to 18th century British India. And I'm looking especially forward to hearing uh, my Indo-Persianist and British Empire Studies colleagues feedback on my comparative framework here because this is not my expertise. So, 18th century British India was a place of a certain amount of identity play. Consider, for example, the early East India Company employees who composed ghazals in Persian, taking on Persian style pen names as a sort of local alter ego. But only occasionally anything we might call fluidity emerges. British involvement in India was at its most accommodating of local courtly ceremonial in its early phases with residents accepting robes of honor and so on. But over the course of the 19th century, they reduced their participation in local court ceremonials of sovereignty and restic restricted the role of Persian in administration and education. As a mile marker for this process, we can take the British government's refusal to accept or reward the major Persian and Urdu poet Ghalib's panegyric Qasida to Queen Victoria in the wake of the mutiny. But in the late 18th century, when British uh, bids for power in India were often articulated through Persianate ceremonial, let's see how the best informed administrators might have drawn on uh, Persianate ceremonial, uh, Persianate formal resources for the symbolic management of difference. So here is the absolute locus classicus uh, for Orientalist reception of Persian poetry. The first line of, uh, Sir, uh, of uh, Sir William Jones's first published Hafez's, uh, Hafez translation, A Persian Song. And this translation and the Ghazal by Hafez on which it's based have been so often discussed that I will restrict my commentary to one observation here. So consider Hafez's line. Agar on tor ke shirazi bedastarad belemara bechol hendu yashbachsham Roughly, if that Turk of Shiraz would take my heart in exchange for his, or her, probably his, Indian mole, I'd trade Samarkand and Bukhara. The conceit of this line depends on two antinomies. First, between the value of a single beloved here in Hafez's Shiraz and two distant, exceptionally rich cities. And second, between that Turk beloved's face, beautiful according to Persian literary convention because of its paleness, and the mole in its darkness compared to an Indian. Although Hafez writes in the city-state of Shiraz, not in an imperial metropole, it is nonetheless a space whose diversity, Turks, Persians, Gypsies, Muslims, Christians, Zoroastrians, Jews, is symbolically brought into order in Hafez's verse in accordance with literary conventions dating to the early phases of new Persian poetry in 8th to 10th century Khorasan, Transoxania, and North India. In that context, the first courts to patronize Persian poetry on a large scale owed their wealth and power to the, their position as an entrepot to the trade of Turkic slaves out of the steppes of Central Asia into the Central Islamic lands and, slightly later, to the plunder gained in invasions of the Indian subcontinent by Turkic military slaves who increasingly ruled the dynasties that patronized the Persian poetry. So that's the sort of arrangement there. Um, the personality traits, physical features, and hierarchy of beauty for non-default physiognomic types in Persian verse, the Turk and the Indian, all owe much to conventional ideas about the particular capabilities of those types in a social ecology that prominently included slavery. 
Hafez writes his Ghazal in a very different kind of state that is nonetheless still ruled by Turks, a state in which social roles, including the appropriate use of slaves according to their origins, are differentiated according to conventions that correspond to literary conventions. The contemporary geopolitics of Shiraz, Samarkand, and Bukhara, the much older conventional geopolit uh, geopoetics of cruel but beautiful Turks and dark and unlovely Indians, all of this is brought into formal order in one bait, in one couplet. And so to Jones's famous translation. Now, we know he's perfectly comfortable ascribing traits to ethnic types. Since, for example, in the same grammar of Persian where he presents his translation of Hafez's Ghazal, he informs us that while the Persians write their poetical works in the Ta'liq script, which answers to the most elegant of our italic hands, Shikaste script is very irregular and inelegant and is chiefly used by the idle Indians who will not take time to form their letters perfectly or even to insert the diacritical points. But this hand, however difficult and barbarous, must be learned by all men of business in India. And yet, Let's look at his translation of that first bait of Hafez's Ghazal. Sweet maid, if thou wouldst charm my sight and bid these arms thy neck enfold, that rosy cheek, that lily hand would give thy poet more delight than all Bukhara's vaunted gold, than all the gems of Samarkand. In fact, even if we look at his non-poetic gloss of the bait, the word isn't there. It's also absent from all other early English translations of the poet I could look of the poem that I could locate. The erasure of that mole's Indianness in a textbook produced for British men of business in India is an absence that speaks. British officials in training must have noticed the word Hindu, likewise the Indians who gave them language tutoring. Of course, it's easy to explain the absence in terms of the problems of translating an extremely compact bit of convention like Hindu equals dark within a literary system British that had limited tolerance for importation of the aesthetics of this foreign literary system. But that's the point. In British imperial world literature, as indeed in uh, Roman, uh, Roman imperial world literature, the metropolitan system of cultural forms interacted with the systems of colonized peoples. And there have been many brilliant scholarly studies of these kinds of interactions. It's this kind of interaction premised on relatively stable hierarchy, if not cultural hegemony, that models like Mary Louise Pratt's contact zone or Homi Baba's hybridity observe from below, the accommodations and reappropriations of the conquered. But in such cases, the degree of genuine mutual transformation of cultural forms is modest compared to Stalinist world literature or post-colonial world, Cold War culture. Um, and the stability of the hierarchy also limited the degree to which the British or Roman imperial systems of distinction could draw on local resources for symbolic management of difference. Sir William Jones's oft discussed adaptation of Mughal comparative philology into the Indo-European hypothesis is the exception that proves the rule. Consider how quickly the pursuit of linguistic and religious common ground became the basis for completely new hierarchized civilizational categories. And I'm certainly not suggesting European colonial empires didn't adopt and indeed exploit existing schema of difference, but there's something about the formal eclecticism of Soviet multinational culture that's different, that anticipates Cold War post-colonial culture. And I look forward to hearing what you think about that idea in the Q&A. So before we return to Lahuti's robe of honor ceremonies, I'll take a Soviet case of classical Persian reception that more directly corresponds to Hafez and Sir William Jones. The Stalinist uses of the romance of the seven beauties, Haf Pekar, by the 12th century Persian poet Nezami Ganjavi, Ganje being in present day Azerbaijan, that's where he's from. Nezami's major status in the Soviet canon of world literature owed much to his identification as the pre-modern national poet of Soviet Azerbaijan. And it is this aspect of national canonic delimitation, the artificial partitioning of pre-modern literary canons into national literary traditions that has most often drawn scholars to the topic of Nezami's Soviet reception. 
This is because during the Cold War and for decades afterwards, the methodological rubric under which most research into the Soviet East was conducted was what's called nationality studies, a field whose goal was to understand the formation and operations of national identity. But in the Soviet multinational system, Nezami contributed far more to the symbolic management of difference than simply providing Azerbaijan with an autochthonous tradition of prestige literature. Rather, as Isabel Kaplan points out in her great dissertation on the nationalization of Soviet Azerbaijani culture, Azerbaijani discussions of Nezami, quote, emphasized his internationalism defined both in terms of the content of his work and his place in the canon of world literature. This is in part because Nezami is not merely a writer whose identity markers can be read into the Soviet system of national difference. Rather, his romances themselves perform a variety of cultural identities through distinct generic markers. His universally acknowledged masterpieces are five long narrative poems, or masnavis, subsequently referred to as the Hamse or the five. The three poems that tell a single long story each draw on a specific repertory located in cultural geography and genre. In each case, a genre whose memory persists in the conventions of medieval Persian romance. Lelio Majnun pastiches the literary conventions of classical Arabic love poetry in a tale of the desert. The Eskandar Nome engages with the Alexander romance tradition and its geography of wonders. And Khosro Shirin engages, albeit more, direct, uh, more indirectly, with the memory of pre-Islamic Iranian royal chronicles and the cultural space between Iran, Armenia, and Byzantium. And I should say in passing that this doesn't begin to exhaust what these extraordinary poems do. Here and throughout this talk, my discussion of the classical Persian works themselves is just to establish my initial premises, but I'm happy to discuss my approach to these classical poems more in the Q&A. Most suggestive for Soviet cultural planners was Nezami's Haft Pekar, in which the pre-Islamic prince Bahram courts and marries seven princesses from the seven climes and builds them seven domed pavilions, black for the princess from India, yellow for the princess from China, green from Khorasan, red from Saklob, which is etymologically, though not always practically associated with the Slavs, turquoise from the Maghreb, sandalwood from Rum, Byzantium or perhaps the West, and white from Iran. And here you can see the painting of this arrangement that he stumbles upon in the wilderness, which inspires his matrimonial and architectural project. As the preeminence of this image suggests, we're meant to think of this as an eternal arrangement. Within the medieval system of correspondences, each woman, nationality, and palace color also matches one of the seven spheres, days of the week, modes, and so on. Over the days of the week, Bahram visits each of the seven princesses to hear a story tinted and themed in accordance with the particular chain of associations. So in comparison to the dark light Indian Turk binary that Hafez holds in suspension, how much fuller and richer is this sevenfold cosmic and geopolitical arrangement of the entire Eurasian space? Although many features of this iteration are Nezami's own, the overall scheme of the seven regions or Haft Keshvar is very old and crucial to the political cosmology of pre-Islamic Iranian imperium. In the fragmented political moment of Nezami, writing Haft Pekar under the patronage of a local dynasty, the romance's vision of universal rule is more a matter of genre memory and political theory than a practical claim. But under the red dome of Soviet rule, there are new resonances for the work's ordered vision of a world of modular units, all telling their variously troped tales in parallel and in harmony. Furthermore, whereas in general, the late comer status of the Russians in world culture was a source of anxiety, this work provides an early prestigious confirmation of their place within that scheme. It's unsurprising that, as you can see here, the Slavic princess's tale was told on its own in Azerbaijani and Russian children's books. 
and adapted into an opera that premiered at the Nezami Jubilee in 1941. In Soviet Nezami scholarship, the significance of this story was mo most often articulated as proof of the long-standing friendship between the Azerbaijani and Russian peoples and in between the peoples generally. But as we've seen, uh, as we've seen, this horizontality in distinction carries another implicit, another implicit message of an architecture that brings the peoples into ordered unity, connecting them to each other, not directly, but through a single point perspective that articulates among them, that sorry, circulates among them serially. This was in fact the procedure of the festivals of national literature and culture that were held for each of the different nationalities in Moscow. And the jubilees that were held for their national writers presided over by Stalin or members of the, Pur Pol of the Politburo. One of the most important revisions of our understanding of Soviet nationalities policy uh, over the past 20 years, produced by Francine Hirsch, Adrian Edgar, Adib Khalid, and others, has been a recognition that the national delimitation and the nationalization of cultures was not ultimately a top-down process. In most cases, it was local intelligentsias seizing what they regarded as an opportunity who hashed out the geographical and cultural boundaries. There's some tension then between the seven domed architectural edifice right, top down, and the seven distinct storytellers. When Stalin gave speeches declaring Nezami to be an Azerbaijani poet in 1939, and the great Persian epic poet Ferdowsi to be Tajik in 1941, and attacked what he called pan-Iranism, Stalin did so in order to firm up the model of the autochthonous nation that he had been developing since his pre-revolutionary writings. But anti-pan-Iranism meant different things to Transcaucasian or Transoxanian writers or to Soviet Orientalists. The major Persian literature scholar Yevgeny Berchilz, who for much of the 30s warned of the dangers of artificially dividing Persian literature according to anachronistic national categories, apologized in the late 30s for pan-Iranist deviation. In 1941, around the time that he was briefly arrested and his son was sent to the Gulag, he published a book entitled The Great Azerbaijani Poet Nezami. As he wrote later, already in 1938, it was clear to me that the wholesale attribution to Iran of the whole vast colossal Persian literature was not only wrong, but a, was a very big mistake. Persian was used by many peoples whose native language belonged to a completely different language family. I'm not sure that this statement actually constitutes a substantive reversal of his previous pan-Iranist position, even though it was read that way. Unlike some Azerbaijani scholars then and now, he certainly didn't accept the spurious attribution of Turkic language poems to Nezami, even if he permitted the improbable suggestion that Nezami's first language might be Turkic. Rather, like many Transcaucasian and Transoxanian scholars at the time, especially those educated before 1917, he frames his position exclusively as the negation of the Iranian national claim to Persian literature and a recognition that the choice to compose, Persian liter uh, to compose literature in Persian had not been an identity marker in earlier times. Persian becomes instead a language that binds together the nations of Eurasia, a predecessor of Russian. For the Soviets, Persian literature bound together multinationalism as the language of the Tajik SSR, internationalism as the language in which the Soviets fomented revolution in Iran and Afghanistan, and claims of cultural prestige before the West, where the place of Persian in the symbolic system of world literature was well established. Such an ethos was not always more moral or less violent than the British model of imperium as Iranians and Afghans experienced under Soviet occupation, but it was distinctive. After all, while numerous early modern states and empires deployed Persian literature in their bids for cultural hegemony in Eurasia, only one 20th century state did, and that was the Soviet Union. So with this organizing principle in mind, 
let's revisit Lahuti's ritual confirmations of Soviet guardianship of multinational difference and Persian cultural heritage in Paris and Moscow in 1935. Lahuti's role in these occasions was inspired by and, uh, and served to underline the message of two international events, the Soviet Union's high profile participation in the Ferdowsi Millennial Celebration in the previous year in 1934, and Soviet hosting of the Third International Congress of Iranian Art and Archaeology at the Hermitage in Leningrad in June 1935 between the Paris and Moscow meetings. And here you can see a caricature of Ferdowsi's reception in Azerbaijan. Note that he is a guest, uh, but the Azerbaijani comrades can entertain him at a tea house, so everyone feels at home. And these are both major moments in 30s cultural internationalism generally, and establish some of the basic framing for both Stalinist multinational culture and the Soviet Union as a defender of anti-fascist world culture uh, in ways that are not widely recognized and that I'd be happy to discuss more during question time. But one aspect of the Kremlin Friendship of People ceremony derives directly from the commemorations of Ferdowsi. The longer poem that Lahuti gifted to Stalin during the ceremony uh, entitled Crown and Banner, Tajo Beirak, he had produced as part of the Soviet Ferdowsi Jubilee celebration after field research in the north of Tajikistan on production record competition between cotton growing collective farms. Uh, the poem opens with a brief passage quoted from the Shahnameh describing the Iranians' attempts to take their prince's crown back from their Central Asian Turanian foes um, in what Lahuti describes as a glorification of national honor and national pride. To this chauvinistic past, he contrasts the effort by the Tajik collective farm present at the Kremlin ceremony to beat a production record using not uh, weapons of war, but production implements. Here again, we see a classical Persian geographical and cultural binary repurposed. The Iran-Turan polarity originated as a pre-Islamic Iranian ideological formation that starkly divides Iran's light truth and agricultural cultivation from the dark, mendacious world of nomads on the northern frontier. In Islamic period political discourse, mediated by Ferdowsi's more complex story of a multi-generational conflict between intimately linked foes, the relationship between Iran and Turan served a wide variety of functions in the organization of space and identity. Lahuti explicitly abrogates the conflictual geopoetics of Iran-Turan, but again, as in his contrast between the freeze at Bisatun and the Kremlin ceremony, or between Bukharan sumptuary laws and the Soviet nationalities regime, we have an assertion of historical contrast that nonetheless brings the two historical moments into relation in unexpected and uncomfortable ways. Socialist competition, he seems to say, is a sublimation or reordering of strife between nations. So let's return to the Dobeti that Lahuti composed extemporaneously at the ceremony, or rather to the assemblage formed by rug, robe, and poem. How are the elements rhetorically brought into order here? In one dimension, the poem models the relationship between Lenin and Stalin. In the other, between Turkmen and Tajik. The two uh, formally rhyming pairs here, I'm not talking about the language, um, but the symbolic relationship, they're arranged in a chiasmus. Upon Stalin, A, clothed in his Tajik robe of honor, B, sovereignty is conferred by the Turkmen rug, B prime, representing Lenin, A prime. And in fact, to complete the pattern, another confirmation of sovereignty is this robe called the Khalat or Tun in Tajik in Uzbek, Don in Turkmen, and Khalat in Russian. Ostensibly, it's part of the ceremony as a national costume, since it's an everyday garment in Central Asia. Um, but in Persian court culture, an ex exquisite khalat was a common ceremonial gift from a patron to a dependent. This could be from caliph to emir, as in this Mongol period image of an earlier investiture ceremony, or from emir to court poet. 
we should note that the return of the robe of honor in Soviet multinational ceremonial coincides with its final disappearance in state cultures elsewhere in the Persian cultural zone. In Pahlavi, Iran, the 1928 dress law abolished all extant khalat ceremonies, while in India, granting of khalats at investiture ended with the last princely states over the first decade of independence. Outside the Soviet Union, costume shows and dance performances for the display of ethnic diversity became a feature not of nationalism, but an early Cold War folk, sort of folkish internationalism of the decolonizing world, which drew institutional patterns from the multinational Soviet Union. And as we've seen, at both of the 1935 ceremonies and at many more Soviet Eastern occasions afterwards, gifts of Central Asian khalats provide a focal point for both the celebration of ethnic difference and its blurring, or rather its transformation into a self-conscious role that anybody can perform. And um, Lahuti didn't usually wear khalats, so it's kind of an imposture for even him. Um, but when Lahuti declares the, the French writers to be honorary Tajik citizens, or the Tajik collective farm chief announces that by order of a session of the Central Committee of Tajikistan, the Soviet leaders were to receive mem membership cards of the Tajik government and Tajik national costumes, it certainly fits that bill. As the transcript tells us, once Stalin and company had put on their skull caps and robes, the head of government, uh, Molotov, joked, comrades, maybe now it would be possible not to translate the words of a Tajik to Russian since we have all been made Tajiks. Here, the gift moves up the hierarchy, but not as tribute. Rather, it's giving at once flattens the hierarchy of nationalities, the center plays at being just like the periphery, and reverses the patronage hierarchy. In a bit of very mild carnivalesque, the patrons accept a position offered by their dependents, together with a robe indicating their subservience to the national people, a version of the same reversal that Lahuti described in his speech. And Lahuti makes an equivalent joke himself later on in the ceremony. Thus, the Khilat helps to explore a potentially helpful concept for Soviet multinational public culture, ethnic drag. I've often found this term, which was first suggested for the Soviet case by Nancy Condi, helpful to think about this dynamic of identity play in the performance of national repertories. Molotov's suggestion that everyone has become Tajiks when they put on Tajik clothes fits within a larger pattern um, in which, for example, Stalin quashed artistic representations of himself that excessively emphasized his Georgianness, but joked at public occasions that he was half Asiatic. In the past year, I've had a series of conversations with Jonathan Flatley that have helped me to sharpen my thinking about the ways that multinational culture slips between spokespersonship, minstrelsy, mimicry, and camp. And this requires us to take seriously the agency and self-awareness of non-Russian participants in these ceremonies. Persianate poetics and ceremonial wasn't a resource for Stalinist reification of national difference only in the sense that it contributed to the national repertories of certain Eastern republics. More than that, the various types of formal identity play available as resources within classical Persianate cultural forms were repurposed by writers and functionaries trained in that tradition to become the basis for the multinational matrix of Stalinist culture. So I'm gonna close with a coda not closely connected with the materials I've discussed today in a historicist sense, but a much later literary fragment that captures the spirit of my argument so concisely and intuitively that I couldn't possibly leave it out. Viktor Pilyevin's classic 1999 novel, Generation P, tells the story of a young frustrated poet named Tatarsky, who unable to get his original poetry published, quote, had to content himself with translations from the languages of the peoples of the USSR. But after the fall of the Soviet Union, he transforms himself into an ad executive and starts working for this post-Soviet state, uh, manufacturing consent through psyops of various sorts. In general, the novel is heavy with revived Russian Silver Age tropes of Asiatic restoration, as you can see from this poster, visions of the Tower of Babel, and so on. <clears throat> 
but there's this one moment early in Tatarsky's advertising career when he's having trouble coming up with a concept for an ad for Parliament cigarettes. He consults a paper he wrote in college entitled A Brief Outline of Parliamentarianism in Russia, but finds no guidance there since the Soviet Parliament was a purely symbolic institution. He visits a hippie friend in the countryside, takes magic mushrooms for inspiration, and goes for a walk in the woods. There, he meets an apparition of a Chechen gangster of his acquaintance named Hussein, and he blurts out, I'd like to ask you, as a representative of a target group, this last phrase in English, of course, what associations does the word parliament have for you? Hussein wasn't surprised. After a bit of thought, he replied, there's a poem by Al Ghazavi, The Parliament of the Birds. It's about how 30 birds flew to seek a bird called the Seymour, the king of all the birds and a great master. But why did they go flying off to look for a king if they had a parliament? Ask them. But then the Seymour wasn't just a king, but also a source of great knowledge. You couldn't say that about a parliament. So how did it end, asked Tatarsky. When they had passed 30 tests, they discovered that the word Seymour means 30 birds, Seymour. From whom? A divine voice told them. Pelievin is conflating here at least two versions of the story. Ahmad al-Ghazali's Epistle of the Birds, from which he gets the distorted author name, and Attar's more famous Conference of the Birds, whose title and whose version of the story comes closest. Most modern, sorry, modern readers have almost exclusively read The Bird's Journey in all its variants as a mystical Sufi allegory of union with the divine. But in fact, there is precedent for reading the story as a reflection on sovereignty and the state, particularly in the case of a third version of the story by Ibn Sina. You might think of Hobbes's Leviathan, which opens with this image of unity in multiplicity and the assertion that a multitude of men are made one person when they are by one man or one person represented. But with additional emphasis on the merging of unlike beings into that unity, the hoopoe, the nightingale, the owl, and so on. Furthermore, it emphasizes the mysterious transcendence required to contain such difference and the sublimity of the state, which is different from its component parts, not only in scale, but in kind. The genre of the mystical quest requires little transcendence, sorry, requires little transculturation uh, for a new agey Russian writer like Pelievin. But the Seymour itself is another kind of cultural form, an assemblage of historically and culturally contingent meanings that has made a great transhistorical leap bearing the Soviet multinational literary translator Tatarsky aloft in its talons and transported him into the globalized political ecology of post-Soviet Russian authoritarianism. Really, Tatarsky is transported there by two composite animals, distinct but related, by the Seymour and by the Soviet system of representation itself which provided Tatarsky with an eclectic variety of cultural forms with which to transmute two or seven or 30 into one. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. That was really fascinating and just, you know, uh, complex, the talk that you gave us moving through time um, and material and uh, ending with this brilliant story um, that really, sort of, in the end, bureaucracy wins, doesn't it? Uh, and the state is where real power lies. I had a couple of questions before we perhaps open it up to um, the audience. Um, and just to remind everyone else who's here, please type in your questions in the Q&A um, and Sam will moderate them for himself, uh, I think. So Sam, I have uh, one thought that I had that in this idea of the Soviet self-fashioning and the use of Persian literature, um, you know, for an early modernist, this sounds so familiar. You know, we have 
these relationships between, say, Shah Abbas and the Lithuanians, um, this idea of uh, the or the ethnic drag, we might call it the Oriental drag or a la Turk is something that is constantly happening, of course, in London and Paris, but it's also happening in these so-called Eastern parts of Europe. Um, and I found that interesting whether those identities, which then become suppressed in the project of the USSR, right? I'm thinking of Eastern Europe as it's getting absorbed also. Um, those identities of Persianism or sort of the closeness to that other empire, those aspirations of being empires that the Lithuanians so had or the Polish had, sort of, you know, these of course the later terms that I'm misusing, but what those are getting suppressed just as this sort of ethnic, interesting rise of a Persian poetics is being um, mobilized in the sort of, you know, these Eastern republics, which I thought is interesting. Um, and I wonder if you saw those earlier tropes and how they're being played out in this broader project of the USSR. And the kind of related point was um, that, in fact, this, these robes of, uh, you know, the, the khilat and these ceremonies of uh, investiture and so on are not so much described in the poetic texts, but in the histories. And I'm thinking of the Zafarname, for example, of Yazdi. And I wondered what role the history is played in these, were they sort of, I know they get recuperated after the end of the, of the USSR, right? When, the, when we have Samarkand suddenly becoming the new um, home of all things Timurid in Uzbekistan. Um, but during these early 20th century deployments of Persian, what role did Persian history have or the history writing? So perhaps I'll let you answer those two questions first. Yeah, so I'm going to try and be brief in all of my answers because I, I'd like to, to get to as many as possible. Um, I'll, I'll just say on the first question, you're, you're absolutely right that, that, that uh, looking to Eastern Europe is a really valuable way to tease out some of these aspects, especially because the sort of modularization or, you know, uh, the arrival of the nation as a, as a, a replicable model really happens in Eastern Europe. I mean, um, a lot of the, the way that um, subsequently, um, uh, you know, in the Soviet multinational space and in the decolonizing space, you know, there's like a make your own nation kit um, really emerges from um, the East European reception of German um, romantic nationalism. Um, and and as um, Stathis Gogoris and Mark Nishanyan have, have really argued, I think, very persuasively, um, there's a very direct relationship between Orientalism and nationalism in that period. I mean, if you look at the Greek case um, in, in the first instance, the, the process of inventing the Greek nation is sort of a, a process of purging um, or like uh, localizing and containing everything that is you know, Eastern um, in, in Greekness. And I mean, this happens throughout the Balkans. And a lot of what is being eliminated is that like, I mean, not, not to be, I, I think there's a problem with the word uh, Persian in that it sort of essentializes this as a Persian thing, but the part that is being like cut out or, or contained in folk dress and in all of that in Eastern Europe is this exact legacy. You're right, you're right to say that. Um, like whether we call it Persianate or Islamicate or whatever inadequate term we might choose. Um, so, so yes, that, that, is, that is absolutely something I have on, on my mind. Um, in terms of uh, Soviet use of uh, the Chronicles, um, this is an object of ongoing interest um, in, and especially in the Stalin period because there's this, there's this kind of collective um, interest in the figure of the tyrant. Um, this is actually something that our own Katie Clark has written a good bit about. Um, Soviet writers in the 30s, well, in the 20s and 30s, but especially in the 30s, sort of thinking about not just Ivan the Terrible, but Chinggis Khan and Timur. And, and they are, to some extent, um, looking at the actual 
medieval and early modern chronicles in the beautiful translations that are emerging from um, presses like academia um, for that. Okay. Fascinating. Can I have one more question before we open it up? Sure. This is just such a rich, um, rich talk. Uh, just in terms of the technologies of, of state making and the, your use of photography um, in your own sort of presentation. And, you know, of, of course, I'm looking at, and I kept thinking about this, Tasvir Alinin Barai Tahseen, you know, and this use of the image and this sort of self consciousness of photography, right? The photo of a photo, of the, of the robe, but also of the carpet, uh, you know. I, I wondered what other mechanisms there are for creating it. So this is sort of pushing out from the, the text, the poetics, but I'm just think, wondering about structures that you see, such as photography, printing, and so on. Right, well, and especially given the uh, extremely in, intimate relationship between um, European imperial um, regimes of physiognomy and type making, uh, you know, ethnic type making, and photography, right, at world fairs and so on. Um, I mean, th this is absolutely um, crucial. Um, I mean, I think um, this is something that I've thought less about because language is always where I'm starting from as a literary scholar. Um, but but I think that this 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 question of the refer referentiality of these poems um, to you know objects and then also to occasions, right? Um, to these, to these uh, ceremonies um, is really what makes the poems, you know, simultaneously so hard to read now. I mean, hard to appreciate now, but it's what made them so alive and crucial at the moment of their presentation. Um, I mean, that, that's all I'll say for now about that, but yeah, I mean, you've raised something. Big yeah, no, I mean, and I, we can't even get towards film, um, which is so much part of this project. Um, but Sam, I, I want to thank you. This is really so interesting. Um, and you generously offered to moderate the questions. So I will let you, there's a number of really fascinating questions in the Q&A. Um, so may I have you go yeah. ahead, Mana has one. Yeah, I'll start out with Mana's because it's in the chat where everyone can see it. Um, yes. um, and um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll read uh, part of it. So the, the notion of universalism that uh, you highlight is, is well outlined in scholarship going back to the timid notions of sovereignty and taken up and rearticulated across the early modern, right? So this is something that's widely no, uh, recognized in scholarship to be um, an element of uh, early modern Islamic culture that becomes part of European um, imperial culture um, in various transformed ways. Um, the British were very bad in social exchanges um, and uh, which were under fire from the start from the British side, um, right? And this is to do with the question of what counts as a bribe versus a legitimate gift. Um, uh, but to go back to the translation of, um, of Hafez, um, right, so, so the question of this Hindu and its different associations. Um, right, so is the unlovely association dominant when it's a mole? Yeah, I mean, the, the bit that, that grabbed me the most in rethinking um, this line uh, as I was preparing for this talk uh, was the color uh, contrast uh, as, a, as a typology, um, just because I had half Picard on the brain. Um, but, but there's obviously a lot more there. I mean, and it's not all about tension between, uh, you know, these two opposites, Hindu and Turk. I, I mean, that's just, that's just one element of what's going on. Um, but um, I mean, it's, I guess, I just feel like this bait has in common with that Lahuti, uh, Dobeti, um, just that you've got like uh, these, these pulling apart uh, 
formal elements that are also uh, ethnic repertories, or uh, ethnic is not a great word, but I, I don't know what word to use, uh, uh, that are bound together. Yes, exactly, it's Iham, right? Uh, yes, uh, Mana has nailed it in the chat, so I'll, I'll uh, 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 leave it there. Um, so let me um, pull up another, um, um, someone asked a very practical question of whether this will be available later on YouTube. And uh, the answer is yes, if you go to the Iran Colloquium site or CMES later, you'll be able to see it. Um, okay. Um, Kehan Najad asks, do you have any indication that pan-Iranism was a meaningful or even present idea in the late 1930s Soviet Union, or were Stalin's condemnation simply a reflection of purge-era paranoia? It's very much the latter. Um, you know, uh, pan-Iranism is not a thing. Pan-Turkism is barely a thing in the Soviet Union um, by the 30s. It's, I mean, it's a way of these are all anti-cosmopolitanisms fundamentally. It's just that anti-cosmopolitanism usually refers to its Jewish variety. Um, and um, it's, I mean, so, so what are we talking about when we talk about pan-Iranism? Um, I began this process thinking, and this is the way that most of the scholarship on it goes, uh, that uh, pan-Iranism is something that you use to accuse people of not sufficiently nationalizing um, uh, these, these literatures, like uh, being cosmopolitan about it in the sense of, uh, you know, not treating the nation as the unit of culture. But actually, I've come to realize that even if that's how Stalin uses that term, uh, a lot of the actors in the Soviet East are, and a lot of the Orientalists are using it genuinely in a sense that is about, you know, rejecting Iran's primary claim, not about making a counter claim that is clear and unambiguous. Um, like writers will, you know, complain about pan-Iranists treating Ferdowsi as an Iranian writer. And then in the next breath, they're saying, but of course, Hafez belongs to us as well because Iranians aren't properly respecting his work and only we can properly take care of him until the Iranians are ready for him. You know, so it's not all about the primordial nation um, in my, is, is my sense of things. Um, okay, uh, let me, uh, so um, Rebecca Faulkner uh, says, I'm curious about the astrological significance of the seven domes, especially in the context of political sovereignty, which is absolutely uh, an important part of what's going on. Um, and thinking, of course, of as as far Moraine's millennial sovereign. Um, so uh, would I connect this cosmology and its literary expression to the project of political legitimacy as, as he does? I mean, I think there's no question that when we're, we're dealing with uh, medieval and early modern texts, those things are are linked. I mean, whether I would frame it in exactly the way that Moeen does, um, you know, th th this is not the area of my expertise. Um, but but I mean, the question is, what does that become um, in modern instantiations? I mean, of course, there's plenty of astrology still in uh, 20th century politics, um, but not so much in in the Soviet context, at least not in a public way. Um, so I, I'm not sure what I would do with that here. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, so uh, Jonathan Flatley, uh, hi Jonathan, uh, says, uh, uh, it seems like this moment resonates too with Marx and Lenin's thinking about the class in itself and the class for itself too. It reads as a kind of allegory of that transformation maybe, um, but, um, I'm interested in the moment when Stalin participates in ethnic drag, when he puts on the robe and skull, skull cap as if he is or becomes for a moment a member of the Tajik nation. Um, he's wondering whether I have more thoughts about how I see sovereignty being represented and negotiated at this moment. Um, how, does, how the meaning of the ritual may change over time as the relation between the Russian center and Tajik or Uzbek um, ethnic national periphery changes as it becomes more or less hierarchized. 
Yeah, so first of all, on this question of um, the nation as kind of an allegorical stand in for class, um, I think that that, that absolutely um, works. And, 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 and Stalin repeatedly makes this um, an explicit point of comparison, that just as we're heightening the contradictions of class in order to ultimately end class, um, we are maximally developing national cultures um, in order to eventually achieve a single proletarian culture. Um, and, and so, um, you know, this, this is where I think uh, the sort of, uh, the, the, the simpler, you know, uh, version of this that um, in, in scholarship on the Soviet Union sort of saw them as like frustrated that people cared so much about nation, right? I mean, uh, that, that they weren't focusing enough on matters of class. It doesn't quite get at, I mean, I think that even with Stalin, the, the, the thought was more subtle than that. Um, now, uh, about the question of how the meaning of the ritual changes. Um, yeah, this has been a very synchronic um, approach to uh, Soviet multinational culture. And it's true that like, on the one hand, um, for, at, the, at the point when these rituals originate in the 30s, the degree of participants' awareness of their contingency um, and that particular kind of play is at its height, you know, because uh, they, you know, people haven't been raised in schools uh, that sort of gave them this reified idea that they belong to nations and so on. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, late Soviet culture, you know, post, let's say, uh, post Khrushchev culture is, I mean, the tendency of all things to fall into a slightly campier uh, mode um, works against that. Um, and so, and so there, there are sort of different, I, I wouldn't say that it's more playful, more fluid in terms of its hierarchy at one time than another. Um, it's more that where the play is located changes over time. Um, okay, uh, Claire Roussine, hi Claire, uh, says, uh, there were many moments of gender play as well as nationality play among the examples you've given here. Yes, there were. Uh, from ambiguous gender and Persian at love poetry to the creepy interaction between um, uh, the collective farm girl and Stalin to the dynamics of performance at say the 1935 exposition um, with women like Tamara Hanum, um, Tamara Hanum being an Armenian woman um, uh, from Transoxania who uh, was like the figurehead for the unveiling campaign. Um, you know, she, she was a, a, a dancer of various uh, ethnic dances um, at Soviet public performances, but she also like uh, would do public like you know performances of unveiling to encourage other women to unveil. Even though you know as an Armenian, uh, the veil was not such a charged thing for her in the first place. Um, but so, could you talk more about the gendering of national representation in the Soviet context? Yeah, I mean, and as with other imperial contexts, this has often been framed as you know the male colonizer, the feminized uh, colonized. Um, and that's not always how it, it goes in, in, in the Soviet context. I mean, there's plenty of, you know, uh, Russian big brother um, things, but there are also, for example, films in which, you know, it's um, a, a Russian woman arriving at the periphery, um, you know, marrying a, uh, an ethnic, man. Um, I, I, I also um, would, well, let's see, what did I have in mind? Uh, I mean, there's, there's more to be said about that. Well, I mean, okay, there's the case of Lahuti and his wife, right? Um, who, uh, by the end of Lahuti's life, are almost um, co-producing these texts as bilingual texts. Um, and and like they really speak with one voice in two languages that set, like has a, a complicated relationship between the two language versions of the text, especially in, for example, Lahuti's late love ghazals. Um, 
which really are are kind of extraordinary to read from the two directions, right? Uh, the one speaking to the other, the other speaking to the one. Um, that doesn't quite get us to the politics of it, which I'm not sure I'm ready to, to say something more definitive about. Um, but the relationship between writer, even national writer, and translator, even Russian translator, um, is gendered in another way with long historical um, background, right? Um, the, the faithful or unfaithful, you know, feminized translator. Um, okay, uh, Francesca chubb confer hi Fran, uh, says, uh, I have a question extending the comparison you brought up between British India and the Soviet Central Asian Republics. The supposed degeneracy of Indo-Persian literature, especially poetry, and the necessity of implementing new and morally improved poetic models, um, yes, which is an extremely like sort of masculinist uh, discourse, um, became a, a cornerstone of the British colonial project in post-1857 India. Was this dynamic a factor in the national literature's question in the Soviet context? So th this is, this is um, great that uh, Fran has brought this up because um, across the board um, in, the late in the second half of the 19th century, um, I mean, I, I'm planning to argue elsewhere that um, really uh, insofar as the Ghazal was sort of a, um, a royal genre, like a, like a, a, a central genre um, um, for uh, Persianate culture, um, all of these anxieties about, uh, about effeminacy, about, um, you know, uh, homosexuality, um, about indolence, um, all of these things that um, colonizers were worrying about in relation to their subjects, and the subjects themselves were worrying about, and Easterners were worrying about even if they weren't under colonial rule, right? Um, a lot of it was deeply structured by anxiety about tarazo, um, anxiety about, you know, these formal conventions of the Ghazal, um, you know, and, um, and so there's, there's a phase in the 20s um, that I've published on elsewhere uh, where the Ghazal itself becomes um, a central object of critique in the Soviet Union. And by the mid 30s, um, that has turned around almost completely. And, um, and everyone is saying, no, actually those, those young militants who are talking about how terrible it is that we write poems about nightingales and roses, they had it wrong because so socialist culture is supposed to be joyous, um, you know, uh, but significantly the element of homosexuality has been erased from um, the Ghazal and from Central Asian lyric generally um, almost completely. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, yes, so um, uh, Claire's addendum, uh, while Stalin participates in ethnic drag, why does he not participate in actual gender drag? Right, so what is the difference here? I mean, uh, I think this is partly a factor of uh, the, uh, the proletarian, the, the, the lingering of the sort of proletarian masculinist aesthetics in, in, into you know, multinational culture that every, one of the reasons why there isn't this straightforward, you know, um, Russians are being, being masculinized, uh, uh, people of the national republics are being feminized. One of the reasons that doesn't obtain in the same ways that that's like uh, a dynamic and an anxiety in European colonial empires is, is specifically that like every, every republic, every nationality has to have a masculine ideal um, because uh, the worker is coded male fundamentally. Um, so that, that, that's sort of why there's this m masculine safety strength 
even in all of the national dresses. Okay, so I'm just gonna take just a couple more questions real quick um, and then wrap up. So um, um, Özgen Falak, uh, hi Özgen, uh, says uh, the seven beauties are represented with different colors in the miniature you shared. Do you think that the colors were chosen based on each nation's specific characteristics? Is there any reference in the text to colors? Yes. Uh, Half Pei Kar is all about color in a way that is really extraordinary. Now, there's actually some problems. Um, uh, there are cases, there, there are some of the instances where it's very clear which color corresponds um, to which uh, 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 not ethnic, uh, but but each origin point of uh, one of the princesses, and there are others where it's 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 less clear. Um, so so but but yes, these repertories include an element of color that is just woven through the entire poem. I mean, it's it's unbelievably complicated when you're dealing with such a rich, multi-layered set of um, of associations. Um, that Nezami very clearly has um, a whole typology in mind, some of which is more accessible to us and some of which is less accessible. Um, but, but the answer is yes. And, um, oh yeah, sorry, just really quick. Um, Yusuf Gursé says, uh, but the peasant is usually coded female. No, yes, right. So, so, so there's the, the, uh, the peasant worker um, dichotomy is, is um, Put onto the male-female dichotomy, but that's actually a little less clear in um, Central Asia because there is no um, established male proletarian figure, um, mode of dress, any of that. So, so let me just um, end with one from um, Emily Laskin. Hi, Emily, uh, and uh, she says, "I'm curious about Lahuti's suggestion to carve Stalin into the mountains of the Caucasus in Central Asia." What's the symbolism of mountains in the geopoetics of this moment or of Eurasian empire broadly conceived? Um, uh, I'm thinking of the issue of the Russian empire supposedly lacking natural boundaries and also about the Iran-Turan geopoetic division. Right, mountain versus steppe geopoetics. I mean, right, so there's this prestranst, but there's this idea of Russian space. Um, in some ways, I mean, as, as Harsha Ram has shown um, in his work, uh, the Caucasus was where uh, the romantic uh, idea of, uh, you know, this vertical sublime could be most effectively brought into um, a Soviet context. And, and, and this ends up being part of Soviet mountaineering culture in the Pamirs um, and so on. Uh, but the question of carving onto mountains, carving images onto mountains, here I think that the primary reference point of that is the Farhad and Shirin story. Um, Farhad being the archetypal worker figure um, from Persian literature that's used um, by, uh, by the Soviets. And he uh, is a digger through mountains. He's a carver of images into mountains. Um, and that's what um, Lahuti has in mind. I'm not sure that answers your question, but it's a very big uh, sweeping step land of a question. So uh, uh, it, it may have to be a longer conversation. Um, so that, that I think wraps up the time that we have. And um, I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, it's been great to talk with you all. And please write to me with any other questions or comments that come up. Have a good day.